invite you to take your copy of God's Word to turn to what is indeed a most familiar psalm, a psalm that we have probably learned since childhood, a psalm that of course has the tendency now because of how familiar we are with it to not hear it. I'm going to read Psalm 23, the entirety of the psalm, all six verses. We note that it is indeed a psalm of David, he himself a shepherd. Let's give attention now to this, the very word of God, in your hearing this day. Psalm 23, beginning with verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the living and true God. Let's pause and ask now for his help, as we always do, as we consider this most familiar psalm. Let's pray. Our Father, now as we humble ourselves before your word, we know that we are creatures of dust. We are very familiar with these words, indeed read. And we would pray that we would hear them again for the first time. That as your servants, we would indeed be zealous to listen to what is indeed very comforting words, but words that highlight the glory of your Son. May you help us. May you keep all distractions away, and may we listen with hearts ready to receive that which you have for your people. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. It is a true statement indeed to say, to utter the following words, the Christian life is indeed a journey. In our culture, there have been many so-called teachers of God's word that have tried to say that this journey, this pilgrimage that we are all running, this race that is before us, is always easy. That it's a life of ease and carefree living. Yet experience, of course, tells us, even God's word as it highlights the very heroes of the faith, as we might refer to them, tells us a very different story, doesn't it? Life is not always easy. It's not always easy for the Christian either. The fact is we live in a sin-wrecked world. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world that has been so marred by sin that it leads us to struggle with cares of life, its pains, its sufferings, and its trials. We struggle with disappointments. And even times we approach despair. King David, who penned the words that we are all very familiar with, is not one who was uh, ill-acquainted, unacquainted with the concerns of life. He himself, tortured by a king, the king that preceded him, a man that the Bible tells us was a man after God's own heart, but yet a sinner still indeed, a man who was often persecuted and maligned and misunderstood, this king pens these words. He's not unlike many of you today. He's not unlike me. He's not unlike you. He's a man who lives in a fallen world, a world that is uh, often wrought with difficulty. And he did struggle. And as you just take a cursory reading through the Psalter, uh, you recognize that he indeed did struggle with many things. And as you even back up from Psalm 23 and you move to Psalm 20 and verse 1, you see there, David, may the writing, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. Going forward in the same Psalm in verse 9, he says, O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. 
chapter uh, Psalm 22, a messianic psalm indeed, words that are very familiar to us, uh, words that the Savior himself used when he was on the cross and uh, in verses 1 and 2, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is David's words. Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Verse 19 of the same psalm, but you, O Lord, do not be far off. Oh, may you help come quickly to my aid. Even in this just cursory uh, gathering of just some samplings of the writings of David, we recognize all too well that he is not unlike us, we are not unlike him. And then comes Psalm 23. You see, Psalm 23 is David's answer to the things that troubled him, to the troubles of life and to the concerns that we all face, that he was facing. As he cried out to his God, he was moved by the Spirit of God to pen what is probably the most well-known psalm in the entire Psalter, Psalm 23. It is not strange even to notice and see, even in funerals, this psalm even referenced, quoted, or preached from for good reason. Because it is full of the shepherd's concern for his people and care for them. Some scholars have identified Psalm 23 as an Exodus psalm. A psalm that seeks to guide the people of God from the bondage and misery of this life into the freedom and hope of that which awaits every one of us in the new heavens and the new earth. Much like it happened in the days of old in the Exodus and the people there for 430 years in bondage to sin and slavery. How God the good shepherd came to, uh, to rescue them. How? Through the work of a shepherd, Moses that he might shepherd them and bring them where? Safely to the land of promise, that land that is not what we long for, that land that is a picture, a type, a representation of the real country we look for, the country of the new heavens and the new earth, where we will dwell then forevermore, as verse 6 of the psalm teaches us, in the very house of God. The psalm is full of encouragement and reminders and exhortations as we consider the Lord our shepherd and redeemer. And so I want to show you this afternoon with God's help that the Lord your shepherd and redeemer loves you, his people, and leads you carefully through this life. I want to show you that this psalm, familiar as it may be, teaches us that the Lord, your shepherd and redeemer, loves you. You are his, you are his people. And he leads you carefully through this life. We will consider this in three points this afternoon. I know that may come as a shock to you because typically there's only two. But there are three points as we consider just the first the three verses of Psalm 23. We will first consider the shepherd and his sheep. Then we will turn our attention to the shepherd's passion for his sheep. And then finally, the shepherd's redemption of his sheep. Let's first consider together the shepherd and his sheep. There are some preliminary assumptions that we must make as we consider this psalm. If we read very carefully there in verse 1, we note that David simply states that the Lord is my shepherd. Preliminary assumption that must be made here immediately is that if there is indeed a shepherd, there must be sheep. A shepherd with no sheep is unemployed. He has no one to shepherd or guide. The assumption, of course, is that David himself is indeed the sheep. But we too are as well. The Lord is my shepherd, he says. If there is a shepherd, there must be sheep in that sheep fold. Now, if you're not a sheep, 
one rightly defined by the scriptures as one who has been united to Christ, who has been bought by the blood of Christ, who has been moved by the Spirit of God to look to him and receive and rest upon him alone, then you cannot and with any integrity say, the Lord is my shepherd. But you are not a sheep. You are not a member of his sheep fold. No, what you can rightly say is that the Lord is my judge who will judge justly my own sin. The companion passage in the New Testament that undoubtedly this psalm is pointing us to is the very good shepherd discourse that we find in John chapter 10. There was no question, at least in this, in my mind, that these are parallels. That as David wrote the words, he's pointing us forward to the very good shepherd of the sheep, the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10 and verse 14, there we read of what he says. What does he say? I am the good shepherd. I am know my own and my own know me that is to say that if you don't know this good shepherd you don't belong to him he is not your shepherd he is your judge and he will come again on that great day and to judge the nations and to judge all those and the works that they have done in the body you cannot say the Lord is my shepherd how do you resolve this problem an eternal one you resolve it by looking to him, to cry out to him. He who invites and bids all sinners to come to him, all who are weary and heavy laden. He is the one to whom you must look, for there is no other shepherd that will matter in the world. Only him. You must look to him. You must cry out to him. You must deal with him. Failing that... The Lord is not your shepherd. He is a consuming fire and a just judge of your life. If you are a sheep and a member of his sheepfold, if you have placed your hope and trust in Christ, even from, again, the discourse of John chapter 10, we notice that the sheep hear the very voice of Christ. How can you know? How can you know? that you belong in his sheepfold. Jesus does not leave us wondering. John 10 tells us that we, as his sheep, we hear the very voice of the shepherd. Reminded of an illustration on this very point in which it has been proven, indeed, from modern-day shepherds that the sheep will only respond to the very shepherd that's appointed to them. They know the voice of their shepherd. They won't come to any other voice. They will respond only to the one who is caring for them. And we read that, don't we, in John 10, verses 14 as well as 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus says, and I know them, and they follow me. We hear his voice. This is not to say that you stand in your bathroom on some morning and hear a voice coming from the mirror or the vent in the ceiling or any other place. This is to say that you hear his voice through the preaching of his word. His voice is given to you in his word. This is where he speaks to you. You have often heard me say that, the, that preaching is, if, it, if many things, it is certainly this. It is the living voice of Christ himself speaking to his people insofar as that fallen minister is faithful to the text of the Bible. For instance, in other words, this moment, this day, insofar as this sermon is faithful to God's word, it is Jesus Christ, the good shepherd of your soul, who is talking, speaking, communicating to you. This is how he shepherds you. This is how he guides you. It is indeed the primary means of grace in the church. Sadly, too many churches these days have set aside this centrality, this central issue for everything else. 
And I just simply ask, how has that benefited the church? Are we better for it or are we weaker? No, indeed, we hear his voice through his word. This is how or one of the ways in which we know, we can know that we belong to this shepherd. But there's another way. Not only do we hear his voice, we respond to it. The sheep hear, and Jesus says, and they follow. They follow me. Wherever I lead them, they will go. Wherever I take them, they will come. Whatever I bring them through, they are there. Whatever I command of them, they are zealous to obey. This is how we know as we hear the voice of Christ, the Good Shepherd, and we're zealous to do all that he tells us. Now, it is certainly true that none of us in this room have heard the voice of Christ perfectly all the time. It is certainly true also that none of you, not, of, not, not me, not you, have obeyed the voice of Christ perfectly every time. He knows that. He's patient with us. He's kind to us. But he's still ours. He has bought us. He has redeemed us. And he will not let go of us. And so he continues to work with us by his spirit that we might continue to strive to hear his voice and follow him even to the very end of our lives. Preliminary assumption number one is that if you do not know this shepherd, you are not a sheep. You are a goat. You are outside of the pasture. You are in a dangerous place. And I would plead with you to turn and look to Jesus. If you know this Savior, this shepherd, you are in a glorious place, a place of listening and a place of obedience, a place of care and concern all of your days. Is there a better place to be in all of the world to know that the creator of the universe is guiding my day, every moment of it, every second? There are also some preliminary admonitions here given by David, embedded really in these words as the psalm opens. As he says, the Lord is my shepherd, it, 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 it wants us to ask, why do we need one? It's not an accident that the Bible describes you, the people of God, as sheep. It's not the only thing we're, how we're described, but it's not all that flattering if you really think about it. Sheep are timid creatures. They're not all that intelligent. They don't have a whole lot of defense mechanism. In fact, they have none. They have to lay down on their back and bleat and cry out for help as the enemy seeks to attack them. Why do you need one? You need a shepherd first because you are prone to wander. Every one of you in this room are prone to wander off the pasture in which God has placed you. I'm reminded of the glorious hymn in our Trinity Psalter hymnal. It's hymn number 429. Come thou fount of every blessing. You know the last stanza. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to lead the God I love. Here's my heart. I'll take and seal it. Seal it for the, thy courts above. You and I are prone to wander, to be attracted to the allurement of this world, to wonder and ask questions as to why do the, uh, the wicked prosper and why are the people of God made, left to suffer? All of these things, they pile up in our minds and our hearts and they lead us astray. And this is a reason why we are so needful of a shepherd, the good shepherd of the church. But not only are we prone to wander, not only are you prone to wander, you are also prone to danger. You are prone to it. We hear reports every week from this pulpit from our ruling elder about our brothers and sisters in other nations in which they are under great attack, great persecution. They are prone to danger. We are prone to danger from within. 
Within what? Within our own hearts. Our own hearts are often our greatest enemy. This is why we need the word of God that guides and shepherds our souls. Why? Because Jeremiah has made it very clear to us that our hearts are desperately wicked. Who can understand these things? Who can understand it? No one. That's the answer. But we're also prone to danger from without. What things are we prone to danger? Well, first, and unquestionably, we are prone to danger from the enemy of our souls. The one who would kill you where you stand if God would permit it. Who hates you for everything you stand for because you have the name of God written on your heart and in your mind. And as Satan himself. And the apostle Peter, who was told at the very end of John to tend to the lambs of Christ, to feed them, to, sh- to take care of them, he writes, on, without surprise, he writes about this very concern. There in 1 Peter chapter 5, a passage that is referencing the elders of the church to shepherd the, the, the sheep and to watch over them. In 1 Peter 5, 8, we read there words that are familiar to you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, and you're it. Every one of you, by virtue of the fact that you know the Lord Jesus Christ today, it doesn't matter whether you're an elder, a deacon, or, or otherwise, a pastor, it doesn't matter if you know Christ today, you have a target upon your back that the enemy is aimed, aiming for and seeking to ruin He wants your soul. You need a shepherd. It's not a surprise to me anyway that Peter penned these words within the context of the exhortation he gives to the elders of the church. Look what he says in verse 1 of 1 Peter 5. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as partakers in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. This is the calling of every elder in the church. Whether ruling elder or teaching elder, your primary responsibility is to shepherd the people of God. Why? Because there is an enemy out there that is seeking to harm the people of God. It ought to burden your soul. As men who might think to be elders in the church, men who might want that office, men who are currently laboring in it, This should move your heart every day because because God's people, the people that Christ came to save, are under attack from from a one who is more powerful than they. But greater is he that lives in them than he that lives in the world. It is no accident that he placed this warning within the context of under shepherds in the church. Not only does he give to us as protection, as a shepherd, why we need a shepherd, uh, elders, under shepherds, he gives us the very words of Ephesians 6, the full armor of God, that we might resist the very efforts of the evil one. We read of this in Ephesians 6 and verse 11, to put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You convinced yet that you need a shepherd? Satan, the hater of our Lord and the hater of all of his people, the full embodiment of everything evil. We need a shepherd because we're helpless without him. But not only are we to be protected from those within, our own selves, our own hearts, and from without, that is the enemy of our souls, but we also need to be protected from the wolves that reign around, uh, that roam around us. Time does not afford me a litany, an encyclopedic review of all the false teaching that exists in the world. I could give you a list if you'd like it. How long do you have? From televangelists on TV promoting things that are heterodox, unorthodox, flat-out heretical in every respect. 
the churches and otherwise that can only be described as wolves and nothing else. People who are beating the sheep, fleecing the sheep, hurting the sheep. And Jesus told us, he warned us about this. The good shepherd said so himself in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, that it would happen. This is why, my friends, it's so important that a minister of the gospel be fully vetted and fully trained. It's not a fail-safe, but it does help. This is what, why it is so important that ruling elders are fully trained and understand their office and responsibilities that they might not hurt God's people. Wolves will come. They will slip in, oftentimes unannounced. But Jesus says we'll know them by their fruits. What fruits? The fruits of their labor, the fruits of what they teach, the fruits of what they preach. I often appeal to you to listen to the very word of God proclaimed, but as soon as I go off the reservation and begin to promote doctrines that are not consistent with our, 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 our historic faith, and more to the point, the Westminster standards that I vow to uphold, you must and you should reject everything I tell you for the sake of your soul. Christ says it'll happen. We need a shepherd that we might be protected from these people because we cannot defend ourselves often against them. Think of the myriads of millions of people in the world today that have been hoodwinked by false theology and doctrine. From denying the very deity of Christ from denying the very triune nature of a holy God and the inerrancy of the scriptures and inspiration. I could go on and on. We must have a shepherd to guide us or we would be perilously lost because we're just not that strong. We're sheep. The shepherd and his sheep. All of this comes because of the shepherd's passion for his sheep, his passion for us, his love for us, his emotion. All of it is poured out in these simple words that David uses here. You're thinking, okay, he's only got halfway through verse, verse 1. We're never going home. Yes, it'll speed up here in a moment. The Lord is my shepherd, he says, I shall not want. What does that mean? Anything I want, I'm going to get. Any exercise of faith to name it and claim it, and I'll have some. It's not what it means. Literally, it can be rendered, I shall not lack, lack any good thing. A good thing is defined by what God, the good shepherd, defines as a good thing. But here we have a recognition by David and we too, a recognition that we are a needy people. I shall not lack any good thing. Why? Without God, the good shepherd, without our Savior, the good shepherd, I will be in lack. I will be in want. That we can do nothing, indeed nothing of our own accord. Think of it. You said it. You admitted it, you prayed it, you confessed it today. What did you say? Let me remind you of that which you say every Lord's Day in this room. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give to us our daily bread. Why do we pray that? Because we are in need. It's not just a meal we're asking for. We're asking for God, the sovereign Lord, to give us what we need. That good thing that comes from his hand, that we might enjoy his blessing with it. Our physical needs for good health for provision of a job and finances that we might uh, be able to pay our bills. But we go on. 
Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And what? Lead us, lead us not into temptation. We long that the shepherd of the sheep not lead us into temptation. We need him. We want him that we might have our physical needs accomplished, but that also our spiritual needs too. Both of them. Because your good shepherd cares about your body and your soul. We have needs. We have many needs. Part of the danger of living in an affluent society is that we just don't give ready attention to any of these things. We give little attention to what we do need. And without God's say so, we would be dead. We have a great need of Him for everything. I know I've used this illustration in the past and I'm going to use it again, but every one of you are breathing right now a need. Try living without breathing. You won't be here long. You have a need to breathe. I doubt you thought about it when you walked in this room, but you've been breathing ever since two o'clock. You've been breathing before that too, and Lord willing, you'll be breathing after. How is that even happening? From the good pleasure of the shepherd of the sheep. We have needs intimated clearly within this expression, I shall not lack any good things. And so he gives us, he provides for us, and David highlights it for us in these physical needs. As he tells us that he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. This provision of physical needs highlighted by this expression of lying down in green pastures to the communion of the saints as one body, loving one another, carrying one another's burdens, looking out for one another's needs and concerns. That's what we do as a church. This is why we gather together on the Lord's Day. This is why we're mindful of the concerns and hurts of our brothers and sisters throughout the week. This is why I inundate your inbox with prayer requests. And we might pray for the physical needs of our loved ones and family here. The spiritual needs met through the church. This is how the shepherd does it. The ordained means of grace through the word, sacraments, and prayer. And through his under-shepherds as they seek to lead his people. Through that communion that can only come as we're united to this shepherd. A mutual accountability and love for one another and the spiritual well-being of one another. Through prayer for and with each other. All these have been provided to us by the Good Shepherd that we might not lack any good thing. And as that happens, there are results that are guaranteed by the Shepherd. David tells us what they are. He makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters a promise of comfort and care the green pastures representing that time of ease free from trial and burden free from the distractions of this life free from the oppression of of friends and family and others a promised comfort and care in trial or difficulty in sickness and in health in life's turbulent times we are comforted by the reality of an ever-present shepherd who loves us and leads us often to those places of respite. He also leads us indeed to the quiet waters. It's an interesting metaphor as put by David here to draw us to the attention of the real sheep that he himself probably cared for, undoubtedly cared for. Sheep will not drink water from a fast rushing stream. It makes them nervous because they're timid. They need quiet water, still waters that are there for refreshment and help. And often the good shepherd of the sheep, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, leads us there. This is why friction in the church, dissension 
within the church is so disturbing to the church and the overall, overall well-being of the church. No, the care and comfort the Savior brings to us is this security and comfort and quiet of the green pastures and the quiet waters. It was Philip Keller. If you've never read this book, you must read it. I say that, must. Don't read it if you don't want, but he was a modern-day shepherd. He wrote a book. The title of it is A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. He says four things about this rest and refreshment that the good shepherd leads us to and highlights it for us. First, it's a highlight of a free of fear, a freedom from fear. We have no reason to fear the present life or future realities. Providence Church has no reason to fear the future realities and as we pilgrim, as we labor to find a building, as we work through all of these things. We put our trust in the shepherd who is leading us. It highlights a freedom from friction, as I've highlighted already and got ahead of myself in my outline, but a disunity in the body of Christ causes unrest. It's unhelpful for the nourishment and rest of the people. Satan wants disunity. He will fracture a church faster that way than any other way. The good shepherd wants us to unite around each other. It doesn't mean we look like each other all the time. It doesn't mean we always agree with each other. That's not the point. United around the Savior and what he wants. A freedom from flies. This is what he wrote. Parasites and pests, wolves, trouble lurking, yields and unrest in the people, in the sheep themselves. Good shepherds in those days, even today, will inspect the, the wool of the sheep as they come in to see if there are any kinds of parasites, any kind of things that might hurt them because they are unable to do so themselves. And that's what your good shepherd does for you. Through his under shepherds, usually, almost undoubtedly. And then finally, a freedom from famine. That is a hunger. It is true that when sheep are hungry, they will not rest. They won't rest. They're hungry. I've often said that goats will eat anything. They'll listen to any sermon, any pastor, any theo theology. They'll eat anything because guess what goats do? Goats will eat cans, mailboxes, license plates, you name it. They love it. They don't care. They're not very discerning. Sheep will not eat garbage. They need good nourishment, faithful nourishment, the nourishment of the scriptures and the word of God. Finally, the shepherd's redemption of his sheep. He restores our soul. Why does it need to be restored? Because without Christ, we are hopelessly lost with no hope in the world. Our hearts are desperately wicked. We are depraved. Through the fall of Adam, we have inherited all of the misery of sin in this life. How does he do that? By forgiving, forgiving us of our sin. This is not just merely conversion. This is every day, all the time. You did that today as you confessed your sin. You hoped for and longed for the blessed promise of forgiveness from your shepherd. He restores our soul through the forgiveness of sin. We do sin. We fall sometimes egregiously. The one who wrote this very psalm fell egregiously. And God forgave him. He called him the apple of his, called him the, uh, a man after his own heart. He does it through forgiveness. He does it through the restoration of the helpless and the weak. Think of Peter. Peter, who was grieved beyond measure at what he did, denying his Lord that he said he'd never do. But yet the Lord, the shepherd, came in great compassion to Peter and exhorted him to feed his people, care for him. And he did. Probably preached the greatest sermon in the early church that has ever been preached there in Acts chapter 2. It's not the whole sermon, by the way. Boy, did he. Gave his life. 
for the Lord he denied because of the love and the restoration of a helpless man. That's you and me. We are helpless people. We have to have him. We need his redeeming work daily in our lives. He guides our path, David says. He's guiding. He's directing. We get in trouble when we start guiding and we start directing, when we start doing what we want to do. Instead of following the voice and the directives of the shepherd, we get ourselves in hot water in trouble when we go our own way. What did David's son tell us? Again, words that are so familiar to all of us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. What? What's he going to do? Leave you to your own devices. You figure it out. Don't worry about it. It'll all work out in the end. No. I'll direct your path. I will get you where I want you. You trust me. You put your hope in me. You pray and plead with me. You trust what I'm doing. I will take you right where you need to be. Too often, friends, you and I, we get ourselves in hot water because we go right off the path and we live as though there is no God or no shepherd. No, we are to trust him. Why? Because he guides our path. He restores our soul and he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Not just any path, the path of righteousness. The path of righteousness that will lead undoubtedly to persecution, it will lead undoubtedly to name calling, the path of righteousness that will lead to people not liking you very much, that path. So much for the health and wealth gospel. So much for easy believism, so much for everything's going to be hunky dory, no problem, but it is going to be that. The end result is that God's people will enjoy his presence forever as he leads us now and in the life to come. That which is prepared for those who love him. So the shepherd and his sheep, and all the benefits you get, they're all yours. The shepherd's given them to you. His passion for you, his love for you, his refusal to ever deny you, to walk away from you, for that would be to deny himself. And then his zeal to redeem you, to keep working with you, restoring you, and guiding you. All of this should comfort you as we live in a sin-wrecked world. Maybe you're suffering this morning, this afternoon. Sorry, the word morning's in my notes. But maybe you are. I know some of you may be. I'm a pastor. I'm somewhat acquainted with some of your concerns. I don't know them all. I never will. But maybe you are. The Lord is your shepherd. He'll never leave you. He suffered much, all, in all ways that you do. Certainly without sin, but he is the one to whom you follow. You follow him. Some suggestions and then we're done. First, remember the comforting words of this psalm. The pronouns are important. The Lord is, change the my of David's own personal expression to your. Or use it as yourself as you say my, referring to you if you know him. The Lord is your shepherd. It is not impersonal. It's not some blanket thing that's got tossed down there to capture the blob of humanity that might believe in Jesus. No, it was personal. He left heaven to take to himself humanity that he might rescue you. And if you know him, you were on his heart and mind. It wasn't impersonal to him. It was personal. It's real. 
It's for you, both as a church as well as the individuals within her. Second, remember that whatever circumstance you find yourself, and there'll be plenty of them, remember, the Lord your shepherd has led you there. I know you might not want to be there. I understand that. But your shepherd has led you there. He has. You're going to trust him? Is he going to fail you? Will he let you down? He's led you there because he is intimately wise and knows what you need. And sometimes we need to be led into dark places. And thankfully, he leads us also to those quiet ones as well. Third and finally, remember that the shepherd of your soul loves you. Even reading the words on the page don't really get there. They seem so hollow because it's so difficult to adequately express the deep, deep love of Jesus for his people. How can one do that? But he loves you. He's daily ministering for you. He's mediating for you to help you, to guide you with gentleness and patience and compassion. Why? That he might bring you to where he is. He does this through the operation of his spirit that he's given to you and the communion of his people in the church. This is your shepherd. This is the one you have professed to love, the one who will never fail you, the one who will never leave you in want, the one who care for you, even to the very end of your life. Amen. Our Father, we thank you as we have again heard a psalm that we all know, but we're reminded again of the great love of Christ for his people. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Are there more comforting words, any more comforting words in your word? He is our shepherd. Help us. We might place our whole lives in his hand, but he will never fail us. Never. Convince us of these truths. Give us faith. Cause us to believe. We ask in the name of the good shepherd of the sheep and the very lover of our soul. Amen.